Hello everyone, this is Jeff Mack. October 31st is the new year for some people following some calendars, especially if you celebrate Samhain. It is also, of course, the time when we begin waiting another 364 days for Halloween to happen again. And I thought I'd just pause for a moment and do something I really like to do and wanted to share with you. I own a lot of very old books. I get them very cheaply. I get them at garage sales, library book sales. I would say that on average I've paid probably about five cents a book. Um, I have been at book sales, bookstores, places, garage sales in particular, where they'll just press a box of books on me and Honestly, I'll usually accept the majority of the books and donate a few of the rest. This is from William Gibson's Distrust That Particular Flavor. William Gibson being the parental unit of cyberpunk, the creator of the classic story Neuromancer, uh, and a fantastic essayist. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, just a little slice. But this is from June 19th, 2000, and it is, Will We Have Computer Chips in Our Heads? And I think I can spoil it from you from the start by saying that he suggests that we probably will have computer chips in our heads, but for a short time, and then we will probably take them out because we will probably have something organic, but that that's like a computer chip, I guess, like John Scalzi's Brain Pal, perhaps. But that's not the really important bit. By the way, this is um, how young William Gibson looked at that time. If you've seen pictures of him recently, this is a very young-looking William Gibson. I'm going to just read you the last bit of this piece here. There is another argument against the need to implant computing devices, be they glass or goo. It's a simple one, so simple, that some have difficulty grasping it. It has to do with a certain archaic distinction that we still tend to make, a distinction between computing and the world, between, if you like, the virtual and the real. I very much doubt that our grandchildren will understand the distinction between that which is a computer and that which isn't. Or to put it another way, they will not know computers as any distinct category or function. This, I think, is the logical outcome of genuinely ubiquitous computing, the wired world. The wired world will consist, in effect, of a single unbroken surface. The idea of a device that only computes will perhaps be the ultimate archaism in a world in which the fridge or the toothbrush are potentially as smart as any other object, including you. A world in which intelligent objects communicate routinely and constantly with each other and with us. In this world, there will be no need for physical augmentation of the human brain as the most significant and quite unthinkably powerful augmentation will already have taken place post-geographically via distributed computing. There's a bit more, but I said I didn't want to read too much. And I would argue, and I don't think this is a particularly difficult argument to make that he was quite right, that we pretty much see in our phones and in our smart devices that, yeah, um, pretty much everything is wired now. It is true that I don't personally have a smart toothbrush, but I'm completely certain that if I were to pause making this video and Google smart toothbrush, they exist. Um, and probably someone out there has some really good reason why you should have smart toothbrushes. With all that said, I just wanted to talk about a thing that I haven't spoken of for rather a while, which is the fact that we live in the future. And we have extraordinary power, extraordinary knowledge, extraordinary reach at our fingertips. Um, literally, for people who use their fingers rather than anything else for phones. I guess fingertips, is, swiping motion counts as a fingertip, doesn't it? I would say. Yep. Literally at our fingertips, or thumb tips, probably. 
it's still fascinating to think about what we can do with that level of individual personal power. We have not yet begun to reach it. We have absolutely reached a point where we can see how painful, how difficult, how challenging, how loud, how angry a world can be when everyone is able to amplify their voices. Um, and we have more than a few debates about which voices ought to be amplified and if they are amplified properly and which voices perhaps ought to be muted. And I'd like to step away from that for just a moment and remind you, you have extraordinary magic power available to you. If you're able to watch this video, you're almost certainly able to access some form of modern computing and therefore do things that William Gibson thought of as science fiction, probably not just in 2000, but very likely in 2012 when he published that book. And although I can't speak to Mr. Gibson's mind, I suspect he thinks, as many of us think, that we are living in some advanced and amazing future if a deeply complex future whose own future, I guess you can say, is quite uncertain. Please keep that. I hope that you find that little teeny thought, my own small expansion from this thought by Mr. Gibson. I hope it cheers your day just a bit, gives you a moment to think about how cool it is that, um, I don't know, we're living in an age of technology which, um, minus starship travel, has computing power far beyond that imagined in the deeply outflung future of the original Star Trek. It's magnificent and strange and peculiar, and the world is an odd and interesting place. I hope you are enjoying your time in it. I'm Jeff Mack, and I'll speak to you soon. <clears throat> as soon as I can find the off button for this video thing, anyway.